computer. Great. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all for being here. We're excited to have this kind of second installment of our seminar series, having Max back with us. Um, I'm Courtney Dean. I am a project manager and volunteer manager at Neuromatch, and I'm excited to introduce Max. Um, so Maximilian Puello Tuzel um, is a data scientist that works at the intersection of behavioral sciences and artificial intelligence as a research associate at the University of Montreal um, the, and the Mila um, Institute uh, at Quebec. Uh, he's developed new methods for inferring ideology from opinions and has analyzed the theory of social dilemmas. Uh, he's interested in the uh, potential for algorithms to support human decision making for social well being, in particular with regards to public discourse around effective sustainability transition policy addressing the climate emergency. Uh, Max also served as one of our awesome day leads for the inaugural Climate Match Academy that happened in uh, July. Um, so we're excited to have him here again today, and I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, so let's see. I guess I need to share a screen, don't I? Um, so let's see. All right. Um, so this is uh, this was the talk that you guys saw yesterday. Let me just fly through the slides. Um, all right. So hi. Um, great to see everyone. Maybe I can uh, think if I do function F12 or uh, function Alt F12. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's some key that uh, I guess I can just leave the bar up. Um, okay, so hi everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for joining again for part two. Um, so this, as Courtney was saying, this is sort of um, continuation of of uh, the socioeconomic sort of basis of climate change that we went over in the course. Um, you can always get that content because it's always available in anywhere uh, from anywhere anytime um, on our. Uh, on our website. Um, so there were four tutorial videos there that were um, on various aspects that um, this, the talk, uh, the first part of this talk and the talk today will will be complementary to. So we went over socioeconomic origins, um, transition goals and climate modeling, transition narratives and, uh, and public opinion stuff. So um, if you haven't checked out those, it's about an hour of content. You can you can check that out because there's lots of uh, complimentary stuff to what I'm what I'm going over here. Um, so the last uh, the last seminar um, last month was the first part of this, which was on the transition as a concept, um, how what the sort of mainstream perspective is as as given by the IPCC and what the IPCC is as an organization that sort of sets sets um, the mainstream agenda, and then how do we think about societal change that is sort of predicated um, on the changes that the IPCC is sort of um, supporting. So uh, today, oh yeah, and that's uh, that seminar is online. Uh, you can always get that at our YouTube, YouTube channel. There's a YouTube channel. There's a seminar playlist that you can check out that this that today's talk will also be added to in all future seminars. So um, check that out. Uh, in part two, which is the second and last part, <laughs> Um, I will cover uh, more coordination-oriented um, stuff. So both as a as a concept um, and as a necessary component of a of a successful transition. So this is kind of about how we understand phenomena involving sort of multiple um, interests that are interacting with goals that are partially aligned, but also kind of at odds. Um, and so then I'll give you some um, past examples of coordination at play in. Uh, in environmental regulation and try to dissect what the incentive structure was that actually led to their success or failure. And then last, um, I'll give my sort of broad, but you know, I'm sure subjective synthesis of 
um, what the current state of the momentum is in this transition. And then I'll, I'll, I'll shortly conclude um, uh, with some suggestions for sort of how to move uh, for you particular being participants that have just come out of this course with these skills, how to sort of maybe take this big picture and, and apply it in your own um, personal setting. And so my hope here is that, um, you know, you feel empowered to incorporate some of the understanding of the sort of complex global momentum um, when you're assessing and planning um, your future options. All right, so coordination problems. Um, so at some level, the world becomes a lot simpler uh, to understand if we sort of leave out, leave out all, the, all the content of human culture and norms, and we just consider humanity as sort of a bunch of specific humans deciding and acting with partial information and limited resources. Um, sometimes simply by coping and taking from an imposed set of choices, um, but also maybe sometimes formulating goals and planning strategies um, to achieve them. And then human culture and societal structure are then features that sort of influence these decision-making processes. Um, but, uh, and of course, you know, it's the eventual collective feedback from all these individual decisions that defines culture and society. So there's no less complexity in this uh, in this perspective, but I at least find it sort of clarifying, um, like a starting point. Um, now, of course, we don't all have the same agency. So um, who has agency? Agents. <laughs> um, but of course, agents uh, can be subsumed into a sort of abstracted agent. So think of employees in a company, how at will are they to really um, deviate from what their responsibilities are within that company. Of course, it can happen, but there are strong sort of incentives for them not to deviate. Um, so in some sense, maybe we could think of companies as their own agents because they they, they fulfill goals and and uh, and have strategies, et cetera, et cetera. So agents can actually exist at multiple scales and le levels of abstraction, de 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 depending on um, in incentives. And agents can also actually be captured by other agents, right? Just because you're walking around doesn't mean you're really doing everything based on your own, um, your 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 own will. So, for instance, there's this notion of capture. So, uh, typical examples are are uh, uh, a politician's agency is captured by by the elites, so elite capture, or um, a creator's agency is captured by a, a certain audience. This is the phenomena whereby someone sort of becomes a character of themselves because they've, they have they find an audience that really wants that character. And so they just become that person. Um, and then are they really, how much age, agency do they have, right? Uh, okay, so what kind of agency? So of course, you know, people are, are have, uh, finite ability to sort of reason through things. There's, you know, so many factors in the world, uh, they can't consider all of them. Um, we often use heuristics, which are just sort of like rule of thumbs rather than actually like planning, like seeing what would happen if given my model of the world. Um, there's also just imitation, right? People can just sort of be like, ah, I'm gonna do what that person did. Um, and of course, everyone's doing this with like, very limited information, um, but there is a sense that people have preferences, right? Or preferences over histories of like, like, did I like how that went or would I've preferred it to gone dif differently? And of course, this isn't just about like, how much money did I make? Uh, because there's many more motivations that, that we have. There's reward that comes from social interaction. There's reward that comes from getting information about stuff. There's reward that comes from um, being put in a certain emotional state. Um, and going back to what I said at the beginning, there's, there's this sense in which like many of us are just coping, um, which doesn't really allow us the ability to plan over longer horizons. Um, and so that's obviously going to affect our decision-making as well. So all of the agents, like companies, people in the world, I'll, I'll get to a more, uh, specific list later, but there, there's, they're all doing this kind of thing in a, in a very fuzzy way that's hard to get any formal handle on, but but uh, I think it's still possible to get intuition on, and that's what I want to sort of transmit today. So um, we're all actors, uh, and collective action is how we act in response to some state of the world. 
Um, and in that response, coordination offers a lot, um, both to us as individuals, but also uh, to the large systems that are operating. So for instance, so supply demand in markets, in capitalist markets, or like centrally planning uh, economies in, in more like socialist spheres. So um, coordination is, is very useful, but it also opens us up to uh, coordination failures. Um, so social dilemmas are a particular kind of problem that collective action faces when rational individual actors are sort of trapped to produce collectively suboptimal results. Um, the, so these are cases where uh, we're better together, but either because of greed or, or fear, we end up doing something that's sort of bad for everyone. And the classic example is what's called the prisoners in, in, in game theory is called uh, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, where sort of not being able to communicate with the other uh, means that the temptation to 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 exploit the situation dominates and and you get a sort of suboptimal result. Um, now mapped into the real world, there are many reasons why simple game theory just isn't sufficient as a sort of model for human behavior. Um, but I've still found it a useful framework to sort of refine your intuitions about um, about incentives. So for instance, um, Positive incentives like carrots and negative incentives, incentives like sticks have different effects depending on, on the game and the state of the players in the game. Um, my colleague Antonio Gois has a paper on a toy scenario in which, um, just to give you a sort of climate change example, everyone has the option to contribute resources to solving a problem and the problem is only solved if enough people contribute. Um, and while there will always be defectors, um, they're actually qualitatively different results depending on how rewards and punishments are, are, are dished out in this game. Um, now, of course, this setting isn't enough to capture what's going on in real climate change in action. Um, and it's, you know, maybe a priori not even clear how, how we formulate these sort of resource framed um, scenarios, but people have. Um, so a standard way to categorize resources uh, is by how hard it is to enclose them. So how exclusive they are, that's the vertical axis here, or ex exclude um, how excludable they are. And then the x-axis here, which is uh, whether or not the resources get diminished when they're used, that's called subtractability. So then there's like four classes of, of uh, resources, depending on where you are in, in, in this plot. So for instance, at the bottom left here, there's public goods, which, uh, so things like broadcast T TV, oxygen, um, national defense, where if there's other people using it, it doesn't really lower the value of the, of the resource. Um, and it, it, you can't really like exclude it. It's like, well, I'm gonna have this fighter jet pr protect my house, but not my neighbor's house, right? It's this, uh, that's a concept. Um, and then so, but you can have high excludability. So there, there's a train where you have to pay a ticket to get on. And if you don't pay the ticket, you don't get on. It's, it's that simple. Um, uh, uh, and then there's private goods, which is that like, you know, if someone wears the shirt, now you can't wear the shirt. Um, and it's, it's highly sub subtractable because I had 10 shirts and now I have nine. Um, and so climate change actually exists in the bottom right corner here, uh, what's known as common pool resources, which are both highly subtractable. Um, so, you know, uh, you, 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 you cut down trees, there's less trees left and eventually there's no forest. Um, uh, under the concept of unsustainable resource management, which is where I'm going with this. Um, okay. Uh, right, so common pool resources, what do we know about them? Well, there's been a lot of work. Um, the most luminary researcher in this field uh, is Eleanor Ostrom, who actually won the, the Nobel Prize for this um, in, in economics. Um, and so through sort of eth uh, studying behavior and sort of anthropology and a bunch of stuff, um, they've come, that field of research has produced a lot of best practices and how to manage common pool resources. So have clearly defined boundaries, get most users to participate, monitor effectively, things that, that seem to help a lot in, in stabilizing um, resource management so that the resource is able to, to continue. Humans are not great at this. Um, typically our sort of 
more traditional management structures are, tend to be dominated more by social factors like adjudicating conflicts between people rather rather than acknowledging that a resource is actually finite and like if we don't manage it it'll it'll come up so these are all these problems have have all been framed in an academic context um so what's the resource game being being played here um well it's about sort of a missions and maintaining a good climate. And maybe you could even say, because it's about sustainability more generally, it's about sort of maintaining nature and the services that it provides to us. Um, so let's think about sort of the mainstream framing, which is that of um, international negotiations. So this is a an older work by this guy named Putnam from, um, from 1988, where he framed it as this multi uh, he framed multilateral international negotiation as a two-level game. Um, so the base level is made of different nations that interact via the coupling and their energy economy systems. Um, so here, um, each one of these bubbles is a is a is a country with with its own economy, and these are mediated by sort of con consumers and and companies. These these, these arrows. And these interactions are sort of good services and, and cash flows. Um, and a second level has agents. So for instance, um, heads of state and their negotiators to negotiate the energy economy structure of the lower le level. Um, so these would be things like, you know, trade talks, things at the UN, this kind of stuff. Um, but that presupposes that international coordination is, is actually what gets this so that these lines here are, are actually what gets transition regulation passed, which would be sort of what happens on, on these lines. And that's actually not clear. Um, is it true in practice? Um, well, there's an altern alternative proposal that it instead emerges from so-called distributive, distributive conflict uh, between fossil fuel and green energy interests, um, in this case, in the context of the energy transition. Um, and that plays out mostly actually on a domestic stage. So really just, just here. Um, and a recent analysis of the prevailing interest behind various climate policies showed, so that's this paper here and with this great title, Pris Prisoners of the Wrong Dilemma, taking a little hit at the game theory guys. Um, right, that, uh, um, that they indeed seem to arise more from domestic pressures than from international conferences. So that said, there can still be a significant indirect influence of international politics via peer pressure between nations, as well as um, foreign support of domestic interest groups. Um, okay, so what does the industry lobbying, lobbying of a public interest problem look like on a domestic stage? Well, in one view, People in institutions with agendas um, using particular sets of observations contribute models and solutions, which feed into a political system that selects among different solutions and tries to implement one. And then this gen generates its own issue and the process uh, repeats. So, so this back area. Um, this sequential schema is a bit too organized probably to be a relevant model for real world complexity. An alternative that's probably more faithful to the disorganized nature of real world human organizations is uh, is what I think is a super endearingly named garbage can model. Um, so the idea here is that each agent uh, uh, with influence is expressed via their sort of own individual goals and acts according to particular opportunities presented to them in their own region of, of what they call the choice arena. So there's all these decisions, local de decisions going on between um, influential agents. Um, and that contains the set of available ideas, problems, and solutions. It's kind of like a circus maximus for, for bureaucrats and leaders. And um, coherent movements in this arena arise from an organic alignment of incentives among many such agents. Um, and such alignment also comes in times of crisis. So Mil Milton Friedman, the economist, once said, um, 
Only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. So basically lying in the garbage can. Um, and this model explains, uh, sort of helps understand, I guess, where ideas, uh, cases where ideas are often sort of picked up and dropped many times before they actually take off. Um, and ideas only take off once they have both powerful proponents and a favorable or at least sort of neutral economic outlook for the remaining um, powerful interests. So in this case, um, the abolitionist movement, for example, took off only once both anti-slavery Quakers um, and England's uh, sort of, sorry, powerful uh, legislators in England's government who also happened to be Quakers um, and England's economic opportunities had sort of shifted away from slavery enough that it became something that that everyone sort of jumped on on, on board it. Uh, a less prominent example is the passing of a carbon tax here in Canada, and maybe even sort of the financial, the recent uh, financial isolation of of uh, Russian banking. So um, having uh, having good plans around is essential for them being picked up. But a plan being good isn't sufficient for it to be picked up, right? What's also needed is an incentive landscape from enough of the big players that can sort of push it through. So who are the prominent players or um, agents impacting the choice arena in, uh, in climate change action? Well, uh, there's us, you know, the average person, of course, any one of us is, 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 has just that proportional contribution, but as a collective and, and as people that sort of can, can form coalitions, um, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely a player, what the sort of cultural zeitgeist is, um, because decision makers are influenced by that, maybe, maybe not just, not only by just direct advocacy, but also for like the flavor of what people feel is the right thing to do given the moment and and the incentives um and that's a heterogeneous group right we're not all the same there's um so here's uh a particular grouping called uh, the six americas based on people's perception of of the climate problem this is just one of a handful of ways that you can you can, you can cluster people another group is world governments um who are both representing their respective citizens, but also pushing the agenda of the major industries that uh, that they contain and that obviously lobby them. Um, then of course, there's the oil and gas industry that wants to increase its profits by managing its remaining reserves and, and developing more. Um, then there's banking and finance, including the insurance industry that would prefer to finance stabilizing change than to have uh, then be destabilized by change that it can't adapt uh, quickly to. And then there's the tech industry that's a player here because of its wealth, its control of means of communication, and really sort of as the backbone of logistics in our modern economy. So think of all the competing interests here, um, not to mention that each of these groups is made up of individuals that have conflicting interests themselves, right? Um, planning in these complex decision arenas is, is a so-called wicked problem, um, uh, which makes realizing a coordinated solution actually quite quite challenging. So let's look at some specific examples because uh, history, you know, we, we are human after all and uh, human behavior doesn't change so much. Uh, so maybe we, we can get some sort of insight. Um, okay, so uh, let's learn about some specific examples and dig down into the incentive structure. Um, so an oft-touted example of solved environmental problems is the Montreal Protocol that banned CFCs um, that happened in, in, in the 90s. And the backstory here is that DuPont, which was uh, you know, this giant petrochemical company, uh, they, uh, they produced the bulk of emitted CFCs at that time. And when we as a society realized that the damage uh, CFCs were doing, someone on the inside at DuPont uh, had the sense to start developing an alternative. And so while DuPont's uh, PR team uh, did the more standard approach of, of denial and, and obfuscation, they were working on something on, on the inside. And just as public outrage sort of peaked and there were all these advocacy campaigns, um, the DuPont engineers actually got 
the alternative working. And so it just made sense for DuPont to support a transition to a new regulatory environment where they would have privileged influence as the main, um, as the main producer. Um, so the Montreal Protocol was actually less an example of us sort of forcing an industry to sort of sacrifice for the benefit of the planet and more a regulatory device used by the top producer to coerce the many smaller buyers to converting their processes to use this new alternative, um, which is not trivial, right? Because there's thousands of companies. You have to convince them all to, to, to move. Um, and that's that's not hard. So that's what the achievement was, and that is that is an achievement. I mean, it's a lasting impact of the protocol um, in that the ozone layer is now you know mostly intact. This is uh, because both in theory and practice, it's relatively easy, socio politically at least, um, to stabilize a cooperative state once you're in it. So it turns out that new CFCs, uh, although emitted in in much lower concentrations, are also uh, potent greenhouse gases, um, but not, you know, um, uh, not as influential as, as carbon di dioxide. So nothing's perfect, but, but things do happen and things do change. And, um, it's all because of this sort of, uh, complex circumstance that, that, that allows them to. So another example here, um, is, uh, Ontario's, um, phase out of coal in the 2000s. So, in the last century, Ontario was manufacturing was the manufacturing powerhouse of Canada and used lots of coal as a result. The old coal-powered uh, electricity generation um, was sort of past its prime and um, in, at sort of end, end, end of life, uh, just as the public awareness campaigns were pushing effective frames for how bad coal is on people's health. So there were like really effective ads of like, <laughs> and like smoke in the background. Um, and so the opportunity, um, the opportunity to replace with other sources was there, um, and it took a decade, but electricity generation from coal was completely phased out. And it's a good example of a kind of slow bureaucratic and effective transitioning in which all stakeholders were involved. Um, right. So a non, a non environment so as the next example, a non-environmental but very current example is that of the 15% global minimum corporate tax rate. So over the last decades, countries had found themselves in a sort of race to the bottom where they were progressively lowering their tax rates uh, to attract companies. And uh, a coordinated effort will next year, apparently, for the first time, put in a, 15 per, a global 15% minimum tax. Um, the road's been bumpy and you know the law has been watered down a bit, but all the structure in place uh, is in place for it to actually happen. Um, so, so we'll see how, how, how that goes. Um, okay. So what about, what about failures? Um, so a big recent one regards how we tried and unfortunately failed to do global vaccination in the hopes of ending the pandemic. So the idea was that rich countries would, so this was a specific program called COVAX. And the idea was that rich countries would commit to buying uh, from the program that would use its profits to buy excess from the manufacturers so that it would sell to poor countries at rates they, they could actually afford. Now, tragically, uh, it was a complete failure, mostly because rich countries got cold feet and went directly um, to the suppliers um, or to, to, the, to the manufacturers, but also because there was little sort of consultation with the poor countries to begin with. Um, about how they would need the vaccine. And so it wasn't really clear. The, the efficacy was sort of not, not clear. And according to a report by Doctors Without Borders, uh, right, um, the market-based solution failed because there were also political and ethical aspects to the problem that weren't really meaningfully addressed. So there are other examples of public-private partnerships not functioning very well due to misaligned incentives. Um, but there's also ones in which in which they do work. So I think it's like a case by case kind of thing. Um, so together, these examples show that large scale coordination, coordinated regulation problems can be solved, um, but they succeed when complicated incentives, both designed and emergent, make it worthwhile for the big players involved. Um, and this is the perspective taken by Nobel, uh, by Eleanor Ostrom again, um, very influential in, in, in this talk. Um, who framed the tragedy of the commons, which is this idea of a social dilemma 
of a, some kind of common resource um, as, as actually more a drama between the various actors with complex roles that aren't strictly good or bad. Um, so a recent dramatic event in environmental legislation was the passing of a climate and energy bill in the, here in the, not here, down south in, in, in the US, I'm, I'm in Canada. And probably, uh, this is probably the most significant that's ever been passed. So let me take an entire slide to go into what it is and what its legacy might be. Um, so you might be surprised to know that the US actually has some of the most developed legislation in the world uh, around support for renewables. The sector is over three decades old and came about largely from government-led incentives. Um, these had the support of Democrats, but also Republicans, in part because it was a means to deregulate and decentralize the energy sector. And private investor investment came mostly from companies and individuals that were looking for tax credits. But now, after 30 years, it's actually a pretty powerful lobby. Um, so that's the backdrop on which this recent bill passed. Um, this is a bill that dedicates you know, a third of a trillion dollars to further development of renewable energy. Um, uh, which is like many multiples more than any previous bill, as well as electric to electric vehicles and even regulates other greenhouse gases like methane, which are all, you know, these are all, these are all great things here, the green, the green block. But of course that's balanced. It, it had to be balanced in, in order to pass, or at least that's the, that's the argument. Um, uh, whereby legislatures also got the support of the oil and gas sector, by coupling this development to protection and even expansion of fossil fuel assets. Um, so this balanced industrial appeasement approach fits with that view of regulation as dominated by domestic conflict, which is um, here industry driven rather than by climate per se. Um, now, unfortunately the bill also ign ignores sort of climate justice issues, which we talked about in the, in the, in, in the last talk. And so that's now like a reverberating issue in the climate movement is sort of how, how to recenter those. Um, so many think the bill is still a win because it creates sort of systemic momentum where there wasn't much before and virtually guarantees a robust renewable technology industry that the US can then use its influence to sort of protect and, and export. Um, you know, economic protectionism isn't great, but um, if it's renewable energy, maybe maybe in the context of climate change, it's not a bad thing. So uh, it's definitely not the deal that it, the environmental movement wanted a priori, um, and it's a stark example that in this uh, that in this transition, um, you know, uh, an effective transition isn't going to happen with only legislative progress. People will still have to fight things in the courts um, and elsewhere to to end fossil fuel production. This is in part because um, the right to profit in the short term above all else forms a kind of core set of values, not only held by um, powerful fossil fuel corporations, but also by many sort of mainstream institutions and the decision makers in them. Um, and these values just seem largely inconsistent with, with uh, an effective transition, but things, you know, things are changing. Um, and, uh, so let's, let's take a look at what the current momentum is. Um, there's good and bad. Let me start with a bit of, of discussion on, on the challenges. Um, so there's, there seems there, I guess there's always shifts in sort of geopolitical economic order, but it seems like there's, there are ones that are now that are relevant for, for the climate, uh, so there's a notion of how do we make the energy transition, which involves all this investment and technology in, in sort of bad times economically. Not that bad times are necessarily coming, but people have been talking about recessions, et cetera. And this decade is pretty critical. So how do, how do those two things come together? There's a lot of interesting sort of political economy work on that now that, that tries to understand how you can still get uh, development and deployment of technologies in that context. Um, another sort of interesting thing is that we, we've tend to, we've lived in a world in, in which um, the West, by which I mean sort of North America and Europe have had a sort of dominant influence um, on economic development. And uh, there seems to be sort of shifting 
indicators of, of, of things changing, right? So recently BRICS, so this is a sort of non-aligned group. Um, so Brazil, uh, Russia, India, um, China, and and I think that's South Africa, but now they've added a bunch more countries. And so now there's this sort of block of developing countries that, uh, and developed countries, countries that are sort of playing around with what the allegiances are in, in a kind of cold calculus of economic development and security. And that's that's obviously going to play a role in, in, in how we are able or how effective we are at sort of using the industrial capacity of the world to make this energy transition. And there's this sort of fear that there's sort of a frag the potential frag fragmentation, um, which is uh, a concern because that's one of the the sort of issues brought up in in the shared uh, socioeconomic pathway framework that we went over in the in the course. Um, so then, of course, there's there's issues on the horizon. I mean, this year has been a pretty bad year for climate, I would say, in terms of like news and disasters. Um, but uh, you know, there's this notion of of tipping points, which we also went over. Um, in, in the course, uh, and actually, I guess, in the last talk. Um, you know, of course, it's unclear if, if, if we're there or not, or what that even means, or if, if it's a meaningful con, we, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know the mechanism before it's happened. Um, but that's obviously a fear. So if you look at the curves for methane concentrations, they're just like, they're, they're going up. Why? We don't know. Um, you know, we're, uh, so there's there's a lot of continued science that needs to be done to sort of assess um, how urgent the situation is. But I think for many of us, I mean, it's it's obviously clear that it's urgent, um, and we just need to work towards doing the best we can. So the other thing, though, is that there's sort of a weakening of politics or a loss of faith in institutions, which I think domestically can actually there there are all these sort of regional conflicts now, which are um, it, like within sort of, sort of domestic diff different political groups that are um, leading to a sort of distracted governance away from climate. Um, so things like populist movements and political polarization. And also that these the ideologies behind these politics tend to sort of lose a global vision um, that also you know is drained by sort of pro pro protracted wars and and uh, regionalized political issues like I was mentioning in the in the Two, two points ago. Um, and then there's, of course, the fossil fuel industry, which, uh, you know, doesn't wants to sort of maximize its profits and, and develop. Um, but that's sort of inconsistent with, with us, you know, uh, with a sustainable future. Um, and so up to now, they've been doing a lot of sort of greenwashing and obfuscation, which is, you know, typical of, 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 the types of agents that that they are and the history of what those types of agents do in those situations. Um, but actually more recently, I would say even more worrying is is this sense in in which they're, they're starting to sort of seem like there's actually like public uh, statements. So some, a lot of big com companies, uh, petrol oil companies have, have actually um, walked back their net zero commitments um, to focus on, on sort of more profit stuff. And it's interesting here that um, so there are there are oil countries. So everyone in fossil fuels is making a ton of money right right now. Um, fossil uh, the, the 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 national oil companies are actually re are diversifying and reinvesting in their countries uh, in other industries while the the um, what are called the majors, so the major oil companies, which are the private ones, are, are actually just cashing out. Um, so those are different approaches and they would require different, uh, you know, advocacy strategies. Um, okay, so that was, a, that was a depressing slide of like where things, uh, what negative things are going, but there's actually, you know, there's never been more good stuff too. So let's, let's also emphasize that. So I thought <laughs> this image was great, you know, you think, oh, it's like, I don't know some like eco group. No, it's the central bank. <laughs> um, you can debate how much this is green washing, but you know they've they've been thinking about this for a while, and I think they're worried. Um, 
So in finance, uh, you know, they're starting to mandate climate risks now. Like if you're a company, investors want to see your climate risk, uh, and they won't invest in you if you, if 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 you don't. That's becoming a kind of a, a standard now. Um, there's also setting carbon tariff tariffs and incorporating um, sort of carbon tax and these types of uh, pollution reducing mechanisms into trade. Um, there, there's also large funds that are being assembled. Um, of course, you know, the devil is in the details. How do you distribute these funds to where they need to go? But that's at least an implementation problem rather than just there not being any um, money available. I think people are kind of, I think the finance industry is kind of accepting that some assets will be stranded. So, you know, uh, they won't be so surprised when when that happens and they'll see it as just part of what we need to do. Um, accepting also market failure. So, you know, carbon offset market is not, maybe not what we need to be doing. And I think people are now starting to think about other options. Um, there's this notion of stakeholder capitalism. So this idea that, you know, more interests get to decide, um, which has its own issues. There's, there's something called en enlightened shareholder value, which is a concept that protects uh, leaders in, in companies like CEOs from making decisions that don't directly optimize shareholder value, uh, like, like stock price, Be because right now they're actually legally obligated to do that in many places. And so there's now new legal structures that are protecting decision makers when to give them the opportunity to make the sustainable choice and, and not get uh, not get dinged for it. Um, there's something called shareholder activism. So um, this is where shareholders within a company will sort of advocate for doing sort of transition positive, um, sort of pushing a transition positive agenda. So they actually, so for instance, with Exxon, um, there's a board with 12 people in the last election, uh, they actually got four that are transition positive. So that's like a third, I mean, that's like a, I think that's a big deal. Um, it it turn, turns out that Exxon has since sort of, you know, um, canceled their biofuel program and, and some other things, but, you know, there's a, there's, things need to happen from all sides. And it seems like there are groups within the corporate machine that are also pushing, pushing this. Um, and then just sort of general stuff like, more sustainability oriented framework. So how do we buy products in a way that we're, you know, recycling more or that there's some responsibility for a producer to track that product over its lifetime. So we're not just producing uh, excess and, and, and junk and all the emissions that, that come from, from that. And uh, yeah, I feel like there's, there's examples all over the world of countries doing big things, despite the fact that there are some big defectors around. So it's 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 more justified now, I think, within a domestic context to do something in spite of what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's also a, a positive change. Um, and there are frameworks now to really define what um, accountability means. So specific frameworks and reports. Um, and so now it's about pushing these into the system. Um, of course, in technology, huge uh, momentum, right? The price of solar has gone down like basically like an order of magnitude. Um, lots of interesting areas, heat, heat pumps, you know, this weird refrigerator, apparently it's like you can heat your house from the cold air outside. Um, great idea, technology is amazing. Um, but we just need to create the incentive framework so that, and the communication framework such that these technologies get, get out into the world. Um, and, you know, people might not like talking about it, but like, we're probably going to need a climate engineering solution at some point. Um, so this is a, a graph that I've shown in various contexts. Um, so the idea is this is sort of the impact over time and, you know, we can completely eliminate, eliminate our uh, emissions. Um, but then we're going to need to do more because there's still too much carbon in the thing. So we need to pull carbon out of the, and, and greenhouse gas out of the, atmosphere. These are called negative emission technologies. Um, and there's examples here. So direct air capture is one idea, which has gotten a lot of funding soon. But yeah, it's not clear that it's really going to be able to have a, a large impact. It's more sort of fine tuning um, 
you can see these these references here and also this idea of uh, enhanced weathering of crushed silicate so this is the idea that when you break apart like a kind of rock it it can actually bind carbon um, and so people are thinking of this as like a massive large scale thing where you get construction stuff which is already there and everywhere and you treat it in some way I'm not exactly sure how it works but um, all of these big solutions are super the, the effects of them are going to be super complicated and so we need to be doing the science now to figure out how that works um, and so what I've listed here are um, articles that sort of articulate what the problems are and 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 uh, will hopefully sort of focus um, scientific research into into figuring them out. Um, another class of problems that we probably need to solve are how to keep temperature low temporarily as we get these negative emission technologies to scale. Um, so this is something called solar radiation management, which, uh, which um, you know people have made proposals for. Uh, there, are, there are controversial ones. There's, you know, more scientific ones, such as this. Uh, there's a, there was a particular stratospheric aerosol injection. So you, you sort of shoot stuff in the air, and it reflects back the light, so less light hits the Earth, um, and so it's cooled down. But you know, it turns out if you do the chemistry a little bit more carefully, it's going to change precipitation everywhere. So that's what this uh, Cisco 2019 report showed. And so we need to be doing these iterative processes of, of research and like proposals uh, so that, you know, when the time comes, who knows, I, I don't know when, um, there's something that, you know, is at least somewhat reliable because right now we don't, you know, it's very much just like pie in the sky um, ideas. But uh, it's exciting to see people thinking about these seriously because they're probably going to be needed. Okay. Um, and then there's the cool like social stuff, right? There's advocacy, like lobbying and litigation. People are doing really innovative things in these spaces. This talk is already too long. Um, and, and activism, right? So this is a, a recent symphony. You know, there, we have these climate activists that are interrupting things to, to try to get the me message out. And in this case, the conductor told the audience to listen. Um, so these are sort of, I guess, seems like effective means for communication. There might be a bit of backlash uh, or backfire effect, but um, I don't know. It seems like, seems like there's growing potential for this type of stuff. Um, so despite progress, targets probably won't be met on time. Um, so just to give some example, and, and that's, I mean, that's the reality, but that doesn't mean it's not worth, um, it's not worth fighting for, right? So let's just look at coal for for instance and sort of how we're slated to 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 do there. So there's um let's see. Uh so this is just uh one example. So yellow here is the Paris target, black, so this is Germany, I think. Um yeah. And on the on the right here and India on the left, their coal production is actually going to go up, not down. Um, um so as a result, you know, year, yearly rates of global CO2 emissions will probably blow past what's needed to hit the, the Paris target. Um, but, uh, and and it's true that like the longer we, we wait to emit, the harder it's gonna be. These are sort of projections for like how, how fast we would have to change and as to hit a particular temperature, um, which becomes more and more. So the, the changes have to be more abrupt the longer we wait. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the standard um, projections actually do still lack a lot, a lot of non-negligible risk. Um, so uh, we're sort of stopping lots of coal, so we're stopping polluting our, our air, and that has an effect on on how much our planet um, reflects light away. Um, and we also won't see the effects of mitigation immediately. Um, so we got to sort of, you know, keep trucking until, until we start seeing it, seeing, seeing it drop. Um, so, um, there's a, um, this is my last slide. So these are some takeaways, I think, um, for, uh, search, searching for impactful products, uh, projects. So 
I just want you to take away from this that few issues benefit from like a strong black or white position and that uh, while you don't necessarily have to engage the complexity of every issue, um, you, you, you should try to be comfortable with it because it's there. And nuance, I think, is, is, is helpful. Um, as you sort of investigate different areas to do your, your climate science, you can sniff out the potentially defeating externalities under any you know, potential climate tech solution. And these, these externalities can be feed, feedbacks onto the ecology, feedbacks onto particular human populations. Um, so I'm thinking of like sort of impact assessments that this kind of mindset, um, think about them as you think about sort of what you think you're well suited to address and, and look for other people that, that share that kind of, uh, that kind of motivation. Um, so I think we, we do need to accept that solutions go through iterations and we should allow for that. Things don't have to be perfect coming out of the box, but we should also acknowledge when there's sort of a core feature of a proposed solution that, that really seems incompatible with, with its stated goal. Um, so there's lots of climate tech now. It's a, it's a high, you know, it's a area that receives a lot of funding now, and there's going to be all sorts of solutions to all sorts of problems, many of them good, but you know, not all. So it's 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 up to you if you want to sort of do some climate science to help with some particular ap application to sort of do your due diligence and try to fig figure out is this is this generally going to have a positive impact within the you know large uncertainties that that no doubt exist. Um, and so going back to Eleanor Ostrom's drama of the commons I, idea, try it try to get a sense if you're interested in a particular problem, who the sort of big players are and like what their motivations are and how they might react to different ways in which you frame your research. Um, maybe even do something like character character sketches. Um, and and uh, yeah, I guess the, the motivation here is to try to find a niche where you can produce something that you think will, will make an impact in a particular context. Um, so I wanted to close with two things. So one is this this uh, article by Mary Heglar. Uh, it's on Medium, so you have to sort of subscribe or something. Um, but it's a nice article that articulates this idea that partial progress is still progress, right? I think that, uh, so the title of the article is Home is Always Worth It. Um, and I think we need to we need to sort of come together to accept that, you know, we're going to blow past some of the Paris things. And that's just that's just the way it's going to be. But we just have to keep uh, there's 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 lots of positive directions that we need to keep pushing. Um, and so finally, uh, I like this quote personally because uh, I like to understand like to know about things. I, I I like this quote by Marie Curie that says, "Nothing in this life is is to be feared; it's only to be understood." Now is the time to understand more, so that we may fear less. So she did some science and then found out that it could have a, a positive social imp, imp, impact. And she put her science in the back of a bunch of cars and, you know, saved on, you know, potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands of people's lives. So uh, we are here doing this amazing thing and we have the chance to, to have a large impact. Um, so let's do it. So I think that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, Let's see, uh, there's Courtney and uh, yeah, I guess we can we can stop there. I don't know, Courtney, is there any? Uh... Oh, um, I should say that for the Climate uh, Match Academy people, I just had a talk with some of our survey people. So we'll be distributing a survey over the next week. Uh, you'll get an email and we'll post it on the Discord um, for some sort of, uh, career orientation. So it's not just for the people who are doing our Impact Scholars program, but uh, but also everyone. So stay tuned for that. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Max, so much for that presentation. Um, and we will post this on YouTube as well if anyone wants to rewatch it or see a lot of the references in there um, and revisit those. Um, we will also hopefully have future seminars as well. So stay tuned in Discord or on our social media and hopefully you'll join us again. So thank you and thanks again, Max.